So, banking is an international business, so the panel will do it in English. Bear with us. At least one of the panelists will, has to do it in English, so everybody follow the suit. Ζητώ συγγνώμη για την αγγλική κάλυψη. Έλεγα ότι ήταν το, το, το τραπεζικό σύστημα είναι ούτως ή άλλως διεθνοποιημένο, άρα μιλάει αγγλικά. Θα το κάνουμε και εμείς αγγλικά. Ε, first of all, I'm not Christos Gortzos, as your program says. My name is Antonis Opeganidis. I'm sort of a journalist. And uh, Christos has not been able to join us until the end. One introductory comment. Uh, if you hear a faint noise going tick-tock, 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 might not be a bomb, or it might be a bomb. If it is a bomb, it's most probably associated with the banking sector in Europe. <laughs> this is an introductory comment. Now for the panel. Uh, Jeroen Dijsselblom uh, is uh, by necessity a friend of Greece. He was... <laughs> he was... Uh, a normal person, a minister of finance of his native Netherlands, and then he chanced on a beast called uh, the Eurogroup. Chairing the Eurogroup, he chanced on our own Yanis 1N Varoufakis, and the rest is history. He came to know Greece, but before doing all that, and being a hate and then a love person for Greeks, if I may say so, he got a close encounter with a banking crisis in his own turf with uh, a mid-sized level for, for Europe, a bank called SNS Real or something like that. And by that, he got to know what bail, what bail in is. And he got to know what the banking crisis is. After that, he discovered the banking crisis on a European level. So in less than 10 minutes, he'll talk to us, to you, on what's next, so it, there is a future, for the European banks. So there are banks, okay, right, and they are European. Mr. Dyson. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for inviting me and, and uh, having the opportunity to be with you today. Um, a, a friend of Greece by necessity, this is new, so I had to think about that. Um, Certainly, due to circumstances, I feel I've become a friend of Greece. Um, that's, that's absolutely true. I want to talk about uh, banks in Europe because when we talk about the economy of Europe and the Eurozone, banks are still crucial. Uh, and unfortunately, in many countries, banks are still not helping to increase growth, but are still holding us back. If we look back at um, the last couple of years, 2017 was a very good year for the Eurozone with very strong growth, far over what could be expected, potential growth, but investments were still not strong enough and productivity was still very low, certainly compared to pre-crisis years. Now, this has to do with the situation in uh, the banks. Our banks in Europe in general are in a much better shape and I think this is also true for the Greek banks. Um, but we're not there yet. More work needs to be done. And a more general and a more structural issue in the banking sector in Europe is that we are simply overbanked. And that's my key point today. Overbanked in a couple of ways. First of all, we are in Europe still far too dependent on banks. Our economy is roughly across the Eurozone uh, financed for 80% by banks, mainly <coughs> bank loans and only 15, 20% by capital from capital markets. And this is almost the opposite to the way the US economy is financed. And this is a real structural issue for our economy. I think it, in general terms, explains why our economy is less innovative, why we are still so slow in picking up growth, why it took us so long to get out of the crisis, why it is still so hard for new innovative firms in Europe young startups, tech firms that want to grow to get uh, financed. This is still a major issue throughout the Eurozone. We are too dependent on banks. We still have far too many banks, in my view, which is a cost issue, a cost efficiency issue, uh, and still too many banks are not fully recovered and are taking away a lot of attention uh, and potential growth. And finally, I think a typical issue, certainly in Europe, in many countries, is that 
the link between banks, politicians, and supervisors is still much too close. And that determines how we treat our banks, uh, and I think we should be more distant and a little more tough on the banks. So I think there's too much protectionism going on. What we need in Europe is less banking and more capital markets. Um, and that was started, that project, by the European Commission. It was called the Capital Markets Union, <coughs> but it has lost its urgency, and I think that's a huge mistake. Um, we have experienced during the crisis when a crisis hit, hits in Europe. If it's a crisis in the real economy for 80%, it then targets the banks that are destabilized and then have to be saved by politicians who then lose the elections. If it's a crisis in the financial sector, it then heavily hits the real economy, uh, hit, heavily hits on the government budgets, derails, leads to austerity. We really need to uh, cut that link, and the way to do it is to have deeper, well-developed, well-integrated European capital markets. So the new European Commission really has to reprioritize the project of capital markets union. And in my mind, the urgency of that will only increase due to Brexit. Final remarks, what does that mean for banks? You still need to get through the remaining legacy issues. There needs to be a consolidation operation throughout the banking sector in uh, Europe. Uh, and by the way, consolidation shouldn't start at the top, but should start rather at the bottom of the banking sector. Further cost cut cutting is inevitable and more investment in technology will be needed for banks to get that new uh, future, that new position. Finally, let's at least and quickly finish the banking union. I shouldn't be saying this to a Greek audience. I'm saying this also when I go to Germany to German audiences and in my country to Dutch audiences because the biggest hold up to finish the banking union to really establish a well-integrated banking union in Europe, the biggest problems at the moment are in the Netherlands and in Germany. So trust me, I tell the audiences there the same thing. Let's finish the banking union. Uh, and EDIS, the European Deposit Insurance Scheme, is a fundamental element, a block, a building block of that. If we want liquidity to move around in conglomerates of banks throughout Europe, we need EDIS to get rid of these liquidity constraints. If we deal with these two things, reprioritize the Capital Markets Union and finish the banking union, there is more potential growth uh, in all of our countries. Thank you, Jeroen. Uh, as you see, it is uh, a peculiar quality of Jeroen Dijsselbloem to give the feeling that there are solutions, maybe even simple solutions, and I'm confident that in the way he talks about, he talked to us, to you, about finishing up the, the, the banking union, he does it in, in, in Germany and in, in, in the Netherlands. Of course, uh, when talking of consolidation, and thinking maybe of the London's Bank in, in, in Germany, it could be a tough, a tough job, but there is a future. Let's stare at it. Jeroen Dijsselbloem gives solutions, talks of solutions. He does so, let me do a, a tiny, teeny little bit of advertising, even in a book. This book has uh, appeared in, in Greece by Economia Publishing. He was daring enough to present it to a Greek audience, and he talks about partly the banking crisis, mainly the fiscal and the economic crisis of Greece, and about Yanis Varoufakis. Uh, that was into, in, in, intra parenthesis. And now, le let me say a former minister of finance, okay, right, a professor at the University of Piraeus, okay, but Gikas Haidouvelis is a man who survived the hot seat of uh, Greek public life and he saw his name being associated with an email. <laughs> this is a Greek uh, aside. He's a macroeconomist, but he knows what finance is. Gikas Alduvilis, his opinion on is there a future and what kind of future for the banking sector in Europe? Uh, well, uh, th thank you, uh, Mr. Papagianidis. I uh, tend to agree with Jeroen. Uh, Although he gave me a hard time when I was a minister of finance, I agree with him now when it comes to banking. Uh, I think banking in Europe is in, uh, in a bad shape. 
I mean, the last 10 years were not very good. And what I will try to uh, uh, tell you is that uh, I have a presentation, hopefully it will be shown. Um, essentially, if you want to kind of try to characterize what's going on in Europe today, uh, there are essentially two forces that push on European banking. There is a positive force, uh, which is that banks have become a, a more safe institution, so I would say, primarily th thanks to the crisis and thanks to what the regulators did. And there is a negative force, uh, which is uh, low profitability, uh, lots of pressure on their profitability. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you more details on all, on all these issues. Uh, just suffice it to say that Greek banks face all the problems that the European banks face plus NPEs. But we have Mr. Milonas who will explain to you why there is no problem with NPEs later. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll show, uh, I cannot avoid my role as a professor. If you can still see in the back, I have some graphs that I want to briefly show you before I, I talk. And the first graph is a comparison between U.S. banking and European banking. And this is how the market assesses the banks relative to their capital and the price to book ratio, as we call it. Uh, in the U.S., the U.S. banks, throughout the crisis since 2008, the price to book ratio is always higher than the European price to book ratio. There's something that the Americans are doing better than Europeans. We know that in Europe we had a double crisis. It was a bigger crisis than in the US, but they are doing better. And this is shown in this figure, which I have been doing for many, many years now. Here I compare uh, American banks, European <laughs> banks, Greek banks, and then European corporates in the non-financial sector. So I asked the question, if you had put 100 euros back in September of 2004, now 15 years later today, where would you be? Well, if you had bought Greek banks, this is the blue line, uh, thanks to the PSI in February of 2012, you were down to zero, baby, maybe three, maybe three cents or something. If you had bought European banks, that's the red line, you're now at 50. You just have lost in the 15 years half of your capital, actually. Uh, if you had bought US banks, you hadn't done very well either. You were essentially at 130 now. So you made 30 bucks in 15 years when the market was booming all over the US. Only if you had invested in Europe, in non-banks, you would, you would be like, you would like a 280 or something. You even reached 300. So you made decent money. So that just gives you the picture of the sector, okay? Both in the US and in Europe, the US a little bit better, in Europe a bit worse, deadly in Greece. And in Greece, uh, we committed the ancient Greek uh, uh, mistake, which we made the same mistake twice, actually three times. We put our money back in February of 2012. So if you had put your money in February of 2012 in Greek banks and you start at 100, well, November 2015, you were again at zero when European banks were still up there. And if you didn't learn your lesson and you lost your money twice and you wanted to invest a third time and you put another 100 euros at the end of November of 2015 in Greek banks, that's the blue line at the bottom, now you're around 30. You've lost 70%. Okay? Most of these guys are the foreign funds that had joined Greece. They took over the banks and they lost their money again. Hopefully, they're not going to lose. So hopefully, they're going to stay around. So that gives you the picture. I mean, this is what the market says, of course. But the market may be wrong many times. But usually, in the long run, they, they're probably right. Now, what has happened since 2007 to European banks? I told you earlier that there's the good, the good story, which is they're safer institutions. And if you look at them, of course, they have shrunk in size. They have dele what they call they delevered, okay? And what they, in fact, they shrunk in size and they got rid of the bad stuff on their asset size. They are not doing a lot of 
fa fancy trading. They're giving more loans, so the, so the, which is something that's very good. The, the more loans, uh, the loans are, are higher percentage of their balance sheet, close to 50%. In fact, the bad loans have shrunk a lot. I mean, it's a big issue here in Greece, but in Europe, they, in the last four years, they've gone down from a trillion to about 600 billion, a big, big shrink. On the liability side, they're also <coughs> stronger. A lot more deposits as a percentage of their liability side, and a lot more capital. And when we say capital, it's actually real capital now. It's not fake capital. It's not subordinated debt or anything like that. And that's because of the regulation. The, the, the regulators woke up to the crisis. They, they, they said, oh my god, uh, we better, we, we, we're perhaps responsible partly for the international crisis. Let's do our job better. So now core capital has gone up by 40%. All of the ratios are up. I have here some numbers if you can see the because traditional- time flows. Okay. I mean, it's a tendency yeah. of- yeah. Okay, okay. I'll, 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 I'll let you read the numbers. The capital ratios are up. Now, the bad news is profitability. Profitability is down, and uh, total revenue, like in the top 20 bucks, has gone down by 23%. Fee income is down, trading income is down 50%. Uh, in general, profitability is under pressure, because I don't have much time. What's about the future? Okay, that's the past, the last 10 years. Are th will things change? I think on the risk part, uh, especially because of regulation too, I, I'm not worried so much. I think the banks are able to control their risks. Brexit is a big risk, but I think it's manageable. Uh, but profitability is a big issue uh, in Europe as it is in Greece. And banks face uh, uh, stricter regulation, which co costs in terms of profitability. Basel IV is going to come in in, in, in 2022, and it's going to be fully loaded in 2027, and it's really hitting them hard. Uh, the, uh, uh, there are stricter provisioning rules uh, on NPLs and everything. Uh, they face technology as a big uh, competition. You have fintech out there. Uh, they have to invest in technology, and it costs them money, and there's a huge depreciation in technology. It's a new environment. Uh, it costs money. And we're going to move on to more normalized interest rates in the future. Forget about the zero interest rates. And what we do know from history is that, yes, banks can avoid the, to be crushed by higher interest rates, but still, for a couple of years, when rates go up, the net interest rate income goes down before it stabilizes. And we know that when interest rates go up, problematic loans go up. So anyway, the future is tough. Uh, again, on, on, on banks when it comes to profitability. Now, what about Greece? Uh, uh, um, two two, two no. comments, and I'm leaving it to Paul. Uh, Greece has the extra NPE problem. I mean, we, they were not ambitious. Their plans were not ambitious in reducing the NPE problem up to now. They need to do it fast because they cannot give money out there. There are two special purpose vehicles, one by HFSF, one by the Bank of Greece. Hopefully, they will both work. But they need to do more to contain costs, to push their fees. But they fa face a hard time. I, I, I feel sorry for them. But I'll let Paul explain uh, uh, all this later. Thank you to Gigas Hadouvilis for valiantly trying to emulate self-restraint uh, shown by Dijsselblom on the time dimension. And he al already passed the buck or the hot seat to the CEO of the venerable uh, Ethniki Trapeza, Megali Masfili, for the Greek audience, uh, who I hope will try to explain to us that there is some kind of future for Greek banks within the European dome. Mr. Milonas. I'm going to disappoint you. I'm not going to talk about Greek banks. If you want to hear me talk about Greek banks, I'm on a panel tomorrow afternoon, and I will, I will talk to you about Greek banks. Then. So get first the European I, side, so I will, and tomorrow the Greek banks. I will talk to you a bit about the European side. Uh, I'm the third speaker, so always the third speaker. The, uh, the, the previous speakers have taken away some of my punchlines, so I will be more succinct and allow more time for debate. The question is, what's wrong with European ba banks? Both previous speakers said things are wrong. Let's see how wrong they are. The stock prices have dropped 
close to 30 percent, price to book around 0 0.6, 0 0.7, uh, and that's the average. I'm not talking about the crisis countries of southern Europe, I'm talking about the average of Europe. Ten years ago, the top five banks in the world were European. Okay? Now, they're nowhere near the top. The profits of the top five European banks were higher than the top five profits of the American banks. Now, just JP Morgan has more profits than the top five European banks. The market cap of JP Morgan is higher than the top five European banks. So something is not well. What is it? Is it the poor growth prospects of Europe? Is it the poor prospects of the Euro area as a whole, the, the whole European experiment? Is it the capital? Is it the fintechs? Are they, going be, are they going to become utilities, just giving out dividends, low growth, low risk dividends, just like a telephone company? Are they overregulated? Are European politicians taking it out, whipping, whipping the banks? Uh, we heard a few whips from Jerome, I think, uh, blaming the banks for everything. And are we being overregulated from too big to fail to too small to succeed? So it's a bit of an oxymory that in 2000, in the past several years, European banks have improved their organic profitability. Their ROEs are not at the level of the U.S. banks, but they are at 8% and looking to increase. And that, don't forget, is with a, a yield curve which starts at zero and until a week ago was at 10 basis points for the German Bund. It's very hard to be a bank that intermediates savings and makes your money off the spread and have a flat yield curve at zero. Capital is relatively high, 15, 16%, so it's not an issue of capital. Credit losses are down. NPEs, as Giga said, are down to 4%, not a, not a big problem. Loan growth, 3 to 4%, not great, but GDP growth hasn't been that hot either. So we're seeing improvements, but it's not reflected in, in stock prices. What's the matter? They're headwinds, <laughs> short-term ones and long-term ones. Short-term, macro is not very good, mm -hmm. and it's not going to get better. 1.5% next year and 20, 20, and that's at the end of the cycle, of six-year cycle. The cycle is six years old, it's old, it's an old cycle, it's going to turn. Monetary policy, as I mentioned, both the low yield curve, both the low interest rates and the prospects of the ECB raising rates has been moved to 2020, and the potential of the reduction of the balance sheet, which will also add uh, another headwind by, by having corporate bond rates go up because the, the ECB was buying, was buying bonds. We have the short-term, hopefully short-term, political crisis, which is not helping. Italian bonds are going up, and you see the correlation between Italian long-term rates and equity prices. Brexit, etc. So there are concerns about the euro area, and that's that's hurting Greek, the European banks. Finally, we have the, let's turn to long-term issues. What's happening on the regulatory front? MRL, 500 billion that banks have to raise. Okay, 200 base points. This is bail-inable bonds, so they're not cheap. Yeah. That's going to hurt profitability further. PSB2 opens up the banks to the digital uh, competitors, the fintechs. Various estimates I've seen, 20, 30 base points of ROE of, of, of equity, return on equity can go from fintechs. The fee business can be, can go, can be taken away from the banks. Um, Liquidity stress tests could raise LCRs. More need for, uh, for uh, bonds. RWA uh, reviews, the trim exercise probably will hurt uh, some banks, especially the, the very highly rated uh, Norwegians, which have very little capital, but 
I also have very few RWA, so they may get a surprise. Uh, MIFID as well, adding another uh, hit to banks in terms of what they can do. So regula regulation is continuous, a continuous headwind to, to the Korean banks. So what's the hope? What, what can European banks do? I guess the answer is the same whenever we talk about Europe. If we don't integrate into one common market, and there are going to be as few banks there as there are in the U.S., there's very little that, that banks can do to reduce costs. The digital revolution will reduce operating costs to some extent. Branches may close because uh, of all the transaction banking going to the phone, and you need less costs that way. But you need mergers. There are certain countries that certainly, and I won't mention names, could use inter-country mergers. The crisis countries have done a lot of consolidation, a lot. We have four banks in Greece. Spain has reduced the number of banks tremendously, uh, as has Portugal. Uh, some of the northern countries could, if not the northern, the in-between countries, you can say, could do some more. Um, so I think we need to have the European experiment in the banking sector, not just the banking union as defined in the classical sense, but in terms of opening up and allowing big players to play. I'll be controversial and say that in Greece, people say there may be two banks. Well, there may be a need for one bank if we were just like the United States. Okay. So we need consolidation in Europe to reduce costs create the scale to make European banks more profitable. And one last point, compared to American banks, and going back to Jerome's point on the role of capital markets, a lot of the profitability difference with European banks comes from the investment banking fees that they make. So we would love as banks to have more of a capital market business that would help us earn risk-free fees and enjoy the leverage ratios of the United States banks, which are around 10, compared to European banks, which are around half that. So I think there are things that European banks can do to reduce costs, but without consolidation, it's going to be a very tough ride, because not only the U.S. banks getting bigger and more competitive and will be reaching European shores, but don't forget the Chinese banks, which are even bigger than the U.S. banks, and are also going to be very aggressive. Thank you very much. Thank you indeed. Even for, <laughs> even for daring to, to consider what cons banking consolidation could mean in Greece, 2019. And that one bank will be called NBG. Yeah, that, that is more than evident, I suppose. <laughs> but then uh, we have something like a close to eight minutes left. You asked. Uh, of a journalist to moderate a panel, so it's impossible not to have a journalist question, and I turn to, to Jeroen to, to ask a, a tiny question. Would you say that European banks, banks in, in Europe, are being mistreated by public opinion, meaning by us, the media, that they are being bashed in a way or other, and that is a good thing or a bad thing? Um. I'm sure some of that bashing took place in the uh, aftermath of the financial crisis. And um, a lot of people, uh, including politicians and journalists, were, of course, very frustrated by what happened. Now, if you go back to the causes of that, I think it's fair to say that it was this, the same politicians or perhaps the previous generation of politicians who deregulated the financial sector, who forced them or stimulated them to put out lots of cheap mortgages to people that really were at risk of not re being able to repay them. So I think in, um, but we don't have to go back to all the causes of the financial uh, crisis, but for sure it was a joint responsibility. So a lot of risks were not understood, uh, misunderstood, not priced well, and in the end uh, went to the taxpayer who could pick up the bill. So yes, there was a lot of frustration about that. And a lot, and a lot of the work that was done after the financial crisis in terms of reg regulation, extra capital, was of course a justified reaction to the financial uh, crisis. You have to realize, if you look back on 
the deregulation of the financial sector, that going into the financial sec uh, in going into the financial crisis, some banks hardly had any real equity capital in the banks to carry any losses. There was no buffer capacity in the sector at all. No need. Um, so we don't want to return to that. Uh, have we overregulated? Perhaps. Um, I would have been open uh, in a process which we actually started with the previous American uh, administration to look at where we could come to a sort of uh, level playing field with the Americans. And that, on some respects, would even mean deregulating again in Europe. Um, but the current uh, US administration is going in a crazy direction, in my opinion, in terms of deregulating, uh, reducing capital requirements again. And I don't think we should follow that uh, example. So yes, we have to become more competitive, but please, not by deregulating and going back to the situation that we were before 2008. A, a very fast question to, to our banker, right? Uh, as, as a European banker, not a Greek banker, would you say that banks are maybe over-regulated? I think that it's a question of speed. I think that the amount of regulations that are being piled on without allowing the banks enough time to implement them is more of a problem than the amount, what the objective of the regulator is. And with the low growth of Europe and all these regulations just piling on, uh, Basel III, Basel IV, MREL, all this stuff is just one thing after the other. It is not allowing the banks to absorb this regulation. So I would argue it's more a question of pace rather than the ultimate objective. Uh, can, yes. I, can I give you an answer on that? Yes, but don't forget my question too, which oh. would have been, are banks too close to governments and to the regulators? You have been in government, you have been uh, watching banks. Let me tell you about, about the, whether the European banks are over-regulated and I'll come to your questions. When I compare U.S. regulation with European regulation, believe it or not, the U.S. regulators are tougher. And why is that? And I'll give you an example if you don't believe it. Why is that? The reason has to do with the fact that a large bank in Europe, in a European country, is a much bigger institution relative to the size of the economy. The same bank in the U.S is smaller. Therefore, the regulator is more free to do the right thing and push on the bank. Whereas in Europe, the politician is afraid. If they push the bank, they take down the economy. It's a small economy. So they're naturally constrained. And, and there's the example of the 72.5% that I'm sure Paul knows about it, about uh, whether you have your internal model and generates a capital requirement of a uh, hundred, <coughs> and then the regulator tells you, but my model tells you you should be down to 50. And, and, then, and now they have regulation, the, the Americans say, bring it up to 75. The Europeans were saying, no, no, 70, don't, don't be so tough. And they eventually reached 72 and a half as a compromise, really funny. Yeah. Anyway, so. But uh, this is the, the, the endless discussion between politicians and bankers in Europe about are the rules too tough and are the capital requirements too strict. So when I was a Minister of Finance in the Netherlands, I raised the leverage ratio, mm -hmm. which was a minimum of 3% in Europe, to 4% for the Dutch banks. Why? Because otherwise the, the Dutch banks could actually have lowered their leverage ratio down to 3% in the years after the financial crisis. So I said, no way, you need to go up. So let's start at 4 and then we'll move on. And of course, they complained and said, oh, but here goes our profitability, and this is all very problematic. A few years later, the Dutch banks had the 4% and are now mm -hmm. above the 4%, and their profitability has only improved. They're putting out more credit every year, and there is no contradiction. The real issue, and I think here we can agree, is that as long as the underlying potential growth in Europe doesn't improve, it's for banks, it's going to be impossible to improve their profitability. Yes. No, no, I agree. Uh, because, I, agree I mean, you. the reason why... Um, the banks in Italy are still in such a tough, tough shape has to do with the fact that Italy hasn't had any growth for how many years now? Ten years? Mm 
and productivity in Italy is standing completely flat for 20 years. Yeah. And that reflects in the banks. Go and see what, what's on their shelves. It's, yes. it's not good quality. So, um, and you made the same point, Gikas, that I made about our dependence on banks. And this also explains why there is such a strong link to the politicians and why the politicians in Europe are always scared to be a little more tough on the banks. Uh, your, one of your slides showed that the American banks, at least in share prices, recovered quite quickly after the financial crisis. Why? Yes. Because the Americans forced them to come to the government to show that they had enough capital. They got a little time to go to markets. And if they couldn't show that they had enough capital, they were force-fed capital by right. the government, by the Fed. And that was the reason why, yes. in a very short period, the American banks recovered. The European politicians and, and the are Americans, simply The too American state said, here is a trillion dollars. I'll buy everything. And they put their money in Citibank uh, Group, and they can made I, money. Can I, I'm being beaten up by right and left. Yes. But one second. The US, when they had a banking crisis, increased fiscal spending. It had de budget deficit of 10% of GDP yeah. to help the economy come out. The U.S. had growth and the banks recovered. Europe didn't have growth because of their various fiscal rules, good or bad, okay? And therefore, they haven't grown out of a crisis. You can always grow out of a crisis when you have 4% growth for 10 years. That's you, because we're- But we have so grown we, out of we time. We have strict rules. <laughs> Everybody has grown out of, this is, oh, oh, we are dead. Thank you all, <laughs> and uh, read the book. <laughs>